Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Recovery. This is session 47 in our series. If you can believe that, it's hard to, but we started uh, last March, the 26th, I think, just uh, a week or two after the pandemic was declared uh, around the question of, okay, now what? what? What is the library now that the buildings are closed? Are the libraries closed? Well, the buildings are, but the libraries are still functioning. And as we've seen, there's been a, a massive uh, increase in demand for, for library digital services. Uh, and then that, that's evolved uh, to you know, curbside and, and appointments. And you know, we've been kind of going back and forth on how to, how to deal with the services over the past year, a lot of inventive things and, and the circumstances are different everywhere. You know, and Wyoming is different from downtown Dallas. So uh, libraries have been dealing with, you know, the impossible and uh, doing a great job of it. Uh, today, we are having part two of our reimagining and rethinking the library thread, if I can call it that. Uh, we had our uh, first part one back in April of last year, I think. Anyway, it's on the it's on the website, uh, uh, the recording as this will be, and we've got uh, exciting speakers today. Uh, the series is produced by Gigabit Libraries Network. That's us. I'm, my name's Don Means, and these are being hosted and recorded by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA.org, based in the Netherlands. And at the controls is our trusty partner. Stephen Weiber, who's the head of public policy for IFLA, um, an outstanding organization that knits the world's libraries together to the extent that they are uh, institutionally, other than just by their basic nature and charter. Our session sponsor again today is Kelly Dry Warren, LLP, a leading uh, a, a attorney a law firm in DC that specializes in universal service funds and E-rates, and they've been helping us with uh, a filing related to the, uh, the emergency connectivity fund. Okay, slide, thank you. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, this is an article that has, uh, which just came out a day or so to go by uh, uh, Steve uh, Augustino, who may with may be with us today uh, about the, uh, that order that has been released. This is seven plus billion dollars to extend connectivity uh, for libraries and schools beyond the premises, beyond the building, uh, to support students and library patrons wherever they may be and wherever they can be reached. So there's a lot of pieces and parts to this is actually how and when and so forth. And so this is a really good synopsis of the order and the timing on it and uh, Kelly Dry is there to help you interpret that even further. So uh, our speakers today, Allison Marshall uh, with Gensler and Tracy Lesneski uh, with MSR Design uh, are going to uh, take us out. Uh, but first, uh, as ever, it's the COVID report. We always do this. I mean, this is the context for these, these sessions, right? It's the, the, the pandemic overnight civilization just shifted. I mean, everywhere in the planet, we were just trying to do whatever, figure out what the virus would let us do, and then change our environments and our behavior and so forth to accommodate it. Uh, we didn't even know how lethal it was. A lot of things we didn't know, and still quite a few things we don't yet know. But in the past year, it's been you know, just amazing kind of phenomena, horrible and, and awesome at the same time. Uh, we're doing a lot more of this online conversations and online study and pretty much online everything. It was already happening. People were already saying, boy, there's technology is overtaking us. Is, you know, what, what's happening to the world? And it's just accelerated over the past year because of this. So the news of the day uh, is that the CDC came out with a, a new statement saying that you know, if you're fully vaccinated, you're, you're pretty safe, basically. And so you can hang out with other people, you know, indoors and, of course, outdoors. 
And that's been kind of the big barrier. Uh, you know, can we be with each other? They've said for a while that, you know, fully vaccinated people could, you know, have dinner together somewhere or something like that. But now they're just kind of, it, it feels like it's sort of opening the gates. And yet it's only about a third of the population are fully vaccinated. This 154 number is, uh, is at least one dose. I think it's around 115 million that have, that have uh, both uh, fully vaccinated. At the same time, India is uh, in just a, a terrible situation with, you know, and this, this number, uh, most of the experts are saying is, is way low. It is, you know, it's, it's two to five times greater than this. Uh, and, and of course the death rate is uh, trailing the number of cases and it's just a catastrophe. Um, the point being that this is, as the Chinese said on the eve of uh, their successful Olympics bid, one world. And in fact, it is one world because this virus just goes everywhere in the world and we're all kind of in this together. And until we get on top of it everywhere, we are not safe from, of course, the, the big danger is uh, a, a variant that will be resistant to the vaccines and even to the antibodies that, that are built up from having a, even a light case and from the vaccines themselves expiring. We don't know. We don't know how long they're gonna last. So lots of unknowns. Uh, so we would counsel caution, but of course this is all good news that we even have a vaccine. It's unprecedented. I mean, the, the coronavirus is the same family as the common cold. We have no cure for that. Uh, there's still no uh, vaccine for HIV. These are really difficult things to do. And yet somehow uh, our scientists have uh, pulled this off in just unbelievable record time. So that's good, but let's let's be cautious here. <clears throat> so um, the other thing that's happening, as everybody's probably been paying attention, uh, money is being not only printed in Washington, but it's being multiple <laughs> multiple printing presses are running simultaneously, twenty four hours a day, to generate uh, funds to flow into the economy, and uh, through these different programs. One of which I just mentioned, the Emergency Connectivity Fund. There's the uh, Emergency Broadband Act. It's a, it's a subsidy for uh, individuals uh, with lower incomes to be able to uh, afford. Uh, internet access, broadband. And then this is the uh, Build America's Library Act, which I hope everybody's heard about, but it is part of this larger infrastructure package that's being debated with $5 billion to upgrade the, the nation's library infrastructure, yet another infrastructure. And that's long overdue. And it's, a, it's both needed, but it's also an interesting moment Okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna rebuild these libraries, what how are we gonna do that? What what are they gonna do that they weren't doing, you know, a year ago? What's what's changed about the uses, the space requirements, and all the other things that libraries do? Well, that's what we're here to find out or at least learn more about with our guests. So uh, this wonderful quote from Allison. Uh, is there a way to personalize th these experiences? Really a good question, because we think of digital experiences just kind of you know, digital, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. Uh, digital experiences, digital services, uh, especially public services and public information is, is a kind of a, a, a point of interest for us. Every agency at every level of government has been spawning applications since 2000 and they don't work alike and they don't look alike. And by the way, who are those for? And of course they do this for the usual reasons of you know, cost savings and convenience. But if you don't have access, it's no help. As a matter of fact, in the way of things, you start out automating paper processes and then you find there are things you can't even do with paper. So this is, a, this is a disenfranchisement of the public by the public sector, the government, which are not allowed to do that. Amazon can do that, but the government cannot provide public services for a subset of the population. They have to assure access to everybody. And when you, when you approach them about that, they say, oh yeah, mm. well, they can go to the library, they'll help you. Okay, great, yeah. 
but are you sharing any of these savings with the library to do that? No, no. So it's a, it's a bone to pick with. And it's a point to make when you're having conversations about budgets. So I offer that uh, for you. Uh, Tracy, uh, CEO principal at MSR, believes in designing for overall experience. Uh, this, is, this is easy to say, but it is really difficult to do because the overall experience of humans is pretty large and understanding that, translating that into functionality and, and reaction, the way our environments shape our behavior, people really don't appreciate the power of the environment. You know, you have like a habit, you want to change, you go, okay, I've been eating too many cookies, you know, whatever it is. And these, I just think, well, willpower is all I need. Well, it's not, maybe, but it's much easier if you change the environment that causes you to want the cookies, like having them on the counter or something. Uh, uh, a really poor example, but it, the environment is working on us all the time at a whole bunch of levels, and we're really unaware of it, but it just drives our behavior. So this field of design and architecture, which means really anything from urban planning to silverware, is all environmental uh, uh, design elements. And so for libraries to understand this environment and more intentionally create experiences, which means designing for experiences, are critical. So um, our notion or our rather our proposition here is everybody should live near, I mean, close to a library outlet, at least some kind of an access point uh, for accessing library services. Um, these are, this is a library screenshot without credit from Japan, you know, really nice looking kind of setting. Here's, uh, this is Toronto. This is a, a remarkable image. Uh, you just wonder if they're going to be elevated into a spaceship here, but it's beautiful space. Uh, here's an outdoor space. So these are kind of, you know, award-winning sort of uh, uh, library buildings. And then there's the mobile library, the bookmobiles. So here's one, it's not what everybody thinks of, but that's not the point. The fact that it's mobile and it's a library and it goes to where people are. There's another version of that, you know, and, and this one actually has a librarian come with it. She apparently is a librarian. I would go, here's another uh, mobile library, you know, whatever works. And then there's the stations. This has been our, our kind of uh, corner, if you will, of uh, library presence, not the classic bookmobile or the classic library building, but the kiosk or the extension or the remote access station, if you will. And these can take all kinds of forms, be all kinds of places. This is a really good place to set up such a facility because a lot of time gets kind of wasted watch, watching wash uh, rotate in the dryer. Uh, but it's, it's a growing thing. Uh, Libraries Without Borders actually is focusing on, on laundromats as environments to, to install facilities. This, I think, is our image of our favorite kiosk, which is uh, in Tennessee somewhere. So this is electrified. Those are solar panels that create shade, uh, maybe a little rain shelter, place to sit, safe, kind of outdoor. And then those are uh, charging stations right there in the middle of that pole in the middle and they even stuck a little free library on the side. I don't know if the library itself maintains that, but it's a nice image for, a, for a, an access point that, that uh, should be, everybody should be close to you know, a few minutes walking distance. So here we are. Okay, this is our session and we're going to uh, get to it. Um, so we're gonna hear from Tracy first and then Allison. And uh, so have your, have your questions ready or, or enter them into the chat. And we already have some people entering the chat. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more time uh, for people that are joining us uh, to say thank you and also to rename yourself and include your affiliation. If you would, it just helps everybody recognize everybody. So with that, Tracy, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. There we are. All right. You can hear me and see my yes. slides. Yes, yes. Terrific. Okay. Thank you, Don. Um, yep. I'm Tracy with uh, MSR Design. Delighted to talk with you today about some of the impacts we're seeing 
on library design. Um, Don, you talked about how the built environment shapes us and influences us. Um, and it does that not only in behavior, but also through our, our ability to thrive and, and to feel well and be healthy. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, as a design professional, you might say that I'm inherently inclined to find opportunities in any circumstance, even in a pandemic. Um, in no way do I want to downplay the disruption or fear or heart break uh, many of us have suffered through this past year and, and some. Um, but I just want to make the point today that um, a shift in how we think about the built environment due to the pandemic can and should really have, have long-term uh, positive impacts on our communities. And responses in the built environment can make our public places more resilient, more healthy, more equitable, uh, more human-centric and barrier-free. And this is a huge opportunity that we should seize. Um, and so just a quick dip down memory lane. Um, it was this drive to find a silver lining that prompted me to write this article just over a year ago. Um, immediately after COVID hit widely around the world, articles about the built environment flooded the internet. It was fairly overwhelming for many, I think. Um, the vast majority of the pieces were either painting a really grim picture about what it would be like to use buildings together or predicting the death of shared spaces altogether. Um, but we're, we're social beings at our core and shared spaces are critical to our ability to, to thrive as humans and as communities. Um, the World Happiness Report, if you don't know of it, please get in touch and, and, uh, and learn of it. Um, for nearly a decade now um, by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network um, shows year over year that a key to well-being is having strong social and community connections. And of course, the library is, and, and the, the built environment of the library is core to that. So as the world works through reopening at various paces, depending upon locational circumstances, as Don was pointing out, um, buildings need to be responsive to the pandemic's inevitable surges and, and ebbs, and also be prepared for future disruptions that you know, client science assures us are inevitable. Uh, if not carefully considered, however, implementing safety and resilience measures may result in safe places that nobody wants to use. Um, and so this is what I wanted to make clear in my article, um, that we can and should create ways to interact safely in the built environment. I am going to put a link to that article in the chat here too, just for convenience. All right, so back to the opportunity. Um, presented by the pandemic for making our, our built environments better, more resilient, more healthy, and more equitable. There are three aspects that I'd like to touch on today, um, health and well-being, adaptability and flexibility, and becoming more distributed and hyper-local and therefore more equitable. So the first theme is health and well-being. Scientists have been telling us for decades that being outdoors has numerous positive impacts on our mental and physical health, and that just seeing the outdoors and being in the presence of daylight can improve our focus, reduce anxiety, and lower blood pressure. Whoop, I went too fast there. Um, views to a park or nature, or even just a tree or two, uh, are highly effective. And images of nature have an effect as well, though a little bit less than the real thing. So arrange your library to get people, staff and customers alike adjacent to nature wherever you can. And then being outside is even better. It does all of the things that just looking at nature does, plus it helps us focus, it boosts our creative thinking, it improves sleep and boosts immunity. Sunlight helps our body absorb certain minerals. So in addition to being the only option for gathering and for programming through the pandemic, it's beneficial to us on many levels to be outdoors when it's safe to do so. So providing indoor and outdoor connections has been a long time driver for libraries, but investment in outdoor spaces are unfortunately often first to be removed from projects when the resources are tight. Um, I think the pandemic has changed that, frankly. There's an opportunity for more than programming. Um, even just a patch of lawn to do a program is, is terrific 
but you can also build in other ways to teach and learn through demonstration and display so people are able to engage on their own terms on their own time. This library garden teaches about the water cycle in a variety of ways, including by visibly collecting rainwater in an above ground cistern that children can then access to water plants in the garden. Um, play and learning outdoors are sure to continue beyond the pandemic and in cold weather climates where there's often pushback about the value of investing in spaces that may only be used for a certain months of the year. It's proven to be possible through this past year, going through many seasons now, to attract customers to programming, even in cold temperatures and snow. Um, and so I, I do think that's here to stay. In the case of this library project, um, these are diagrams, site diagrams, and you see a rendering in the bottom left. Um, this is a project that kicked off the conceptual phase of work just as the pandemic was starting to shut things down. And the project scope was uh, throughout the design process, it was ultimately expanded to include more outdoor space for gathering and programming and learning, which was right for the project in general. And it was actually something we pitched to them while we were pursuing the project, um, though there weren't resources available for that at the time. The outdoor spaces will serve the community well into the future. It'll be a major contribution to its downtown revitalization, but the money would not have been there had it not been for a renewed focus on the benefits of outdoor public spaces because of the pandemic. Um, another example of the pandemic creating a silver lining is prioritization of indoor air quality. We now know that the air we breathe is by far the largest concern during the pandemic. Um, hence Don's comments about unmasking, feeling a little vulnerable about doing that. Um, the way buildings are, are heated and cooled, the amount of fresh air, uh, filtration, humidity, all of these play a role in a safe and clean air during the pandemic. But here's the thing, these aspects are critical to our health and well-being even without a pandemic underway. Um, when we designed our studio, and that's what you're seeing here, this is our, our space, which opened November 2019. We were in it for four whole months before we were sent home to work, um, but here it is. Uh, we designed it to ensure higher than required amounts of fresh air and filtration because we wanted to walk our talk about designing spaces that support well-being. Um, I'll put a link about our project in the chat as well because there's a nice story to it for, for another day. It's not a library, um, though many libraries are designed there. Uh, it turns out that the very things science was telling us about safe and healthy air during the pandemic were what we had designed into our building just with the driver of creating healthy air for our staff. Um, now I wanna just switch to gears to the touch-free movement as I like to call it. Um, while we know that the likelihood of contracting COVID-19 through surfaces is relatively small, it really is more about the air, um, it's still possible. So ideally we should be reducing touch points as much as practical. Um, and we can do this through simple things like replacing high touch fixtures such as trash bins and um, faucets and things with touchless versions. Um, we can trade out um, entry doors into automatic entries, um, design toilet rooms to have touchless entries. Um, these are, are things that may sound like a short-term solution in response to a pandemic, and you may question whether you should invest in these ways. But there are benefits to going touchless that I think make them long-term solutions. And it really is about removing barriers for people. Um, to use things more uh, without having to interact with them in, in ways that may be difficult if they have mobility challenges, for example. Um, and then there's just the convenience factor for everyone as well. Um, so again, I think the touch-free movement is, is here to stay. All right, the next theme I'd like to touch upon is adaptable and flexible. Um, buildings need to respond both in the long-term and uh, the day-to-day. A lot of focus has been paid to the idea of removing furniture altogether to create more distance between people, directing the traffic flows, moving furniture apart. All of this speaks to the requirement for furnish, furnishings and fixtures to be flexible. Um, flexibility has long-term benefits again here um, by creating user-empowered experiences. 
and providing choice for your customers. And responsive interiors enhance the building's ability to be a useful tool in the library's toolkit long-term as service needs change, as demographic requirements may push different, push the library into different ways of serving the public. Um, so we should also be considering how a space can be multifunctional with ease, just a space. Um, this particular room can move fluidly from a teaching kitchen to a study or tutoring space to just a reading room or a meeting room. And this is important as we consider the idea that future disruptions may require a condensed operational footprint while the library still carries on its mission. Um, we'll say a little bit more about that. There have been many articles by client science scientists warning that pandemics or other climate-driven disruptions could become a much more regular occurrence, not something we like to, to think about, but, but a fact that we should be addressing in the built environment. Um, and now, since policies and social norms and tolerances for stepping outside our comfort zone have already, we've already seen these disruptions, we're presented with this rare opportunity to rethink a lot of things about how we approach building design. Um, we've focused on long-term adaptability and daily flexibility in library design for decades, but the idea of operations and services having to flex between uh, pandemic ready or disruptive ready um, periods and normal periods adds a whole nother dimension to adaptability. So we're considering in our work, the need for library operations to be consolidated for periods of time to an intentional hub for service. So for example, being able to shift gears to pandemic ready in days rather than weeks or months. Um, there are many practical considerations for this, including energy savings and therefore operational costs um, and staff efficiencies while in this consolidated mode. Um, you know, the, the wear and tear on, on staff and trying to respond in the moment um, can be reduced if you've got a plan and the building is ready to respond to it. Um, we don't need to heat and cool and light and clean an entire building when services are, are dramatically reduced or moved primarily off site or online. Um, so the idea of an operational hub impacts how we approach the design of entry, staff areas, parking, so many things. Um, so needs to be considered carefully in a project design or building renovation um, early. But here again, the operational hub um, suggests a distributed or online model, which has another silver lining, and that is bringing the library building to the people rather than making them come to you. And that's uh, the final theme, um, distributed and hyper-local. And I'll just hit a few ideas briefly here that we've been exploring since Allison is going to delve into this um, aspect a little more deeply. Um, we often talk to library clients about using a distributed model during a renovation. Um, rather than closing down or opening a temporary facility, distributing the library throughout the, the community. And when we talk to libraries about that in that context, it's to keep the presence of the library um, around to, to uh, increase convenience, get people who may not have normally been library users, um, give them access and, and, and hook them, if you will, so that they'll come back when the library reopens. Um, creating a series of library nodes or pocket libraries throughout the community or campus that would operate for several months while the building is being renovated. But here now again is the solution that could take hold as a permanent solution as communities and libraries acknowledge that convenience and equity um, that comes from, from this distributed access. Um, Community parks, the library's own grounds, um, offer opportunities for dispersed services as well through short-term pop-ups, um, long-term technology solutions like vending, um, mobile services like the bookmobile and book bikes that uh, Don was showing, um, mobile Wi-Fi hubs like the table that you had there, um, all kinds of ways that the library is reaching into the community and we're seeing more and more of that. We're also seeing a marked uptick in the desire to extend operating hours without staff intervention. Things like Open Plus that maybe were considered a little risky or hard to wrap your mind around um, just a year ago even, um, 
this is where those disruptive norms are making those ideas seem much more reasonable and attainable, a lot less scary than they were just not a short time ago. So exterior kiosks and lockers like you see here that could be used for curated collections or, or just even holds um, just outside of the library's uh, main entry. Uh, those are gaining popularity and we're seeing more demand for those kinds of lockers to be placed around the community in different places. Um, so again, since policies and social norms and our tolerances um, for stepping outside of our own comfort zones are already seeing these disruptions, um, we have an opportunity to seize this moment and make changes that result in more equitable human-centric solutions and, and bring the focus to human well-being. Uh, well, human well-being is not a luxury, it's a necessity. We need, we need spaces that support our ability to thrive. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Allison to delve deeper into hyperlocal. I will stop sharing and mute. Very cool, by the way. Um, I, I, what, was, what was the term you used for the distributed locations? Places. Which you were talking about which, the places outside of the library. You, you had a term. Oh, no nodes or pocket libraries or multinodal. Yeah, I love that. Pocket yeah. library. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Allison, are you? Yeah. All right. Let me yeah. start sharing here. Get this. All right, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, hopefully uh, you're having a great day and really excited to be talking with everyone today. Um, as Don said, I'm Allison Marshall. I am with Gensler. If you're not familiar with Gensler, we are a global design firm and um, bring uh, try to bring a global perspective to, to everything we do. Uh, we also have a research institute uh, within the, the firm that funds research grants every year um, all across spectrums from digital design thinking to future of office to future of library. And just a little bit of context um, as, as I delve into to the topics today, um, a few years back, um, there are um, a small cohort of library geeks within Gensler. We got together and applied for a research grant, uh, specifically looking at the future of the public library. And so um, this was about four years ago now and really dove into this. Um, and when pandemic hit, however, um, it gave us an opportunity to say, hey, why don't we use some of the, the tools and methods that we had been already using through our, our previous research to, to get a pulse on, on what's happening, on the, the fears, the experiments, the, the silver linings that we talk about. Um, and so we, we initiated uh, a few things. So we initiated a survey that was up on the ALA website to, to again, just get a pulse of, you know, what's at top of mind? What's keeping you up at night? What are some of the drivers as we are dealing with the, uh, you know, as Tracy said, and, and Don has mentioned too, the libraries, the building shut down, but the libraries were still open and operational. They didn't miss a beat. And so, you know, what does that look like and, and how is everyone dealing with this? And um, from that survey, we actually, we got a ton of information. Um, and then we conducted a, a roundtable with uh, library systems from around the country. And this was, um, actually, I was pulling up the, our findings report from this and, and looking at this this week. And it was the exact same week last year that we conducted this roundtable. So I think it was May 15th of 2020. Um, so it was a fantastic conversation, again, with uh, systems from around the country um, talking about it you know, what they were going through, what they had been trying, what they were experimenting with. And again, just really gleaned a, a ton of valuable information, um, you know, boots on the ground sort, sort of information from this group. And we were able to, to really start to kind of pair the, the findings, and this is a snip from our findings report. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat if anyone is interested in receiving this document, you can email me and I can send it out. 
but we were able to pair you know, the, the data we were getting from the live survey, the roundtable conversations, and really start to, to look with our designer mindset on, on what, are, what are some of the things that are driving this? What are, where are we going to go after this? Um, the other thing that, that we do, uh, again, Gensler being a global firm, we um, have a multi, I think 24 different practice areas. So we've got experts in, in like I said, in work, in retail, in hospitality, um, in digital experience design. And so we're able to have these conversations about what, what is everyone else doing? What what's happening in the workplace and what does that look like? What does return to work look like? And how can we apply those lessons then to our other sectors? How do we apply that to education? How do we apply that to libraries and other civic and cultural institutions? And so we get to come up with some really exciting conversations and ideas looking broadly like that. Um, but some of the key pieces that, that again came came up again and again, and, and everyone knows this. I mean, this has been the hot topic, right? There is a digital divide, um, not only in America or around the world. And the pandemic show, like, showed us how bad it was. Many of us, I know, have been screaming this from the mountaintops for years. Um, but through the pandemic, people were, act, were able to see, I mean, loud and clear, there was a huge divide. We saw this in schools this last year. I mean, the, the students who did not have access to internet and Wi-Fi at home lost a year of schooling. schooling. So again, something that I imagine everyone on this call has known for a long, long time um, as you deal with this every day, but now our policymakers, our, you know, our politicians, our activists, they can see we've got the data to back this up and say there is a digital disparity and we don't have equitable access. And just as Don joked earlier in, in the call, as you know, civic leaders and civic organizations are pushing more and more of our daily sort of governmental needs online, if you don't have access at home, where do you go? You go to the library. And so this is I mean, hugely top of mind. At the same time, there is a, a tension that we're seeing now because as pandemic has forced us into a virtual world, um, we were on the trend already. It's just vastly accelerated it. And so what we've been talking a lot about is this future hybrid reality. Um, it, it's here to stay. And even as we move back into social spaces and you know we're able to be unmasked, we, there's a lot of great things that we've learned to do. Um, we are more comfortable with them. Again, as Tracy said, you know, we've been forced into this uncomfortable space. We've gotten comfortable with it. And we're going to take a lot of the things that worked forward with us. And so what does this hybrid reality look like? Um, we know it's going to exacerbate the disparities that are already there. And so how does the library step in to reduce those disparities? Um, this is a quote from one of the roundtable that I, I really, really liked. And um, one of the participants just pointed out the pandemic, what it's done, it's pointed out our limits. Like, you know, we've seen these, we had a gut feeling about them, but now we know exactly what our limits are and we can see where the library services need to go. Um, it's not about getting everyone into the library. It really is about how do we get out into the neighborhood, into the community. And so then again, back to this, this tension of a virtual world um, when not everyone has virtual access. And so um, talking more about this, and as Tracy said, this concept of hy hyperlocal, Library is service focus, right? And the services um, are expanding. However, um, you know, one of the things that we have found through the last several years of research and firmly, firmly believe the library's fundamental mission has never changed. The library is about connecting people to resources. Those resources are changing and what we expect from those resources have changed. And so we need new models to connect people to resources. And so that service focused mentality um, is there in the library. And it is the place for all sorts of services. I mean, it is our truly, uh, truly democratic institution in this country, in America. 
that provides a, a, a wealth of um, information, of connection points, of social services, uh, you know, all of these things. And then as, again, as we're seeing in the pandemic, these services and people are more accustomed to, to a virtual telehealth or virtual teleconsulting. And so what does that begin to look like when you have social services physically housed in the library, but they're performing teleservices with people in the community, maybe at a a hyper local connection point that they can walk to to gain internet access. And so really looking at this in, in a new way and taking the walls of the library down so that there is outreach into the community. And I, I really loved Don's um, the slide at the beginning with the little neighborhood sign said nine minute walk. I, I tell a lot of personal stories and the neighborhood library or my community library really because um, it is about a 20 minute walk from me. And so it's, you know, maybe a four or five minute drive if I hit all the lights correctly, but it's, it's a 20 minute walk. And I, I'm in Houston, Texas. Uh, it's pretty hot and humid. So, you know, if you're, especially if I think about, you know, a middle school kid who comes home from the bus, he doesn't have internet access, he would have to walk 20 minutes to the library in Houston heat. We do have parks um, with lots of shade. The park is about a three minute walk from me. And so again, thinking about I'm, you know, a 12 year old kid, I get home from school, I could walk to the park where I'm going to go play basketball anyway. And what does that look like? How does the library have a wireless access point or, you know, a, a librarian who's there at the park monitoring the wireless access point to do homework help with with kids. And so really thinking about, you know, what are these these small scale interventions that can happen. I'm going to have a couple of action points and, and Tracy, feel free to jump in on any of these. So one of the things just like this, the small scale intervention, think small. That's what we're seeing. And that's what we're seeing um, you know, just kind of across the board um, is think about how do you break down what, what is the need and what's the strategic small intervention that can happen. If we're thinking neighborhood scale, we can be a lot more agile. Um, we can have solutions that can be rapidly deployed depending on the situation. And now we know, I mean, we, we've been through this pandemic, we know we are going to have other, you know, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's weather related events, um, again, back here in Houston, hurricanes, flooding, you know, these things happen, we can't plan for them. But if we can plan agile solutions that can quickly adapt to the situation, the library can be there as a resource to really hold those communities together. see my slide is slow sorry guys i'll jump in while you wait yeah. for your slide to go um another consideration as we think about pushing the library out into the um neighborhoods like you're describing and i love the i love the bringing it home to houston conversation allison because i've been to houston i know yeah. i would not want to walk 20 minutes uh in the heat and humidity yeah. that is there um but there's also the implication on what it means to the to the home base, if you will, of the library. So the building itself still. And um, as we think about opportunities with in, in this country with the Build America's Libraries Act coming up, um, we hope, right? It'll pass. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are opportunities to consider grants around readying your building to be able to deploy this sort of um, uh, out in the neighborhood outreach, because there are implications on operations, of course, to serve all those different nodes or pocket libraries throughout the city or community um, that that need to be addressed in the home base. I see that your slide moved. Yes, so yes. <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you make the next yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. So the next point uh, really is about following the people, and so this is um, taking, like I said, taking cues from other other areas of life. Um, you know, where where are people being engaged, and how are they doing it? How you know, we all know retail has been struggling, right, with the disruptor of Amazon and, and all the things. So how are the retail units that are being successful? How are they doing it? Um, you know, we see the the smaller store front shops. Um, what does that look like for a library? Can a library 
take on a small storefront. You know, it's not a large, um, you know, book repository, but it is a place to connect those resources. Um, you know, so so again, taking those cues and looking at ways that you know work now is integrating this this hybrid experience. How is education integrating a hybrid model? What does teaching look like in a hybrid world? Um, and how does the library then learn from that? And they're able to to integrate those into daily practice. And I, I've got a few links on some articles. I'll drop these into the chat as well for you guys, um, especially around digital experience. And what does that look like? And how do we humanize the digital experience so that it, it isn't a, just a cold kiosk, but it is something where you still feel that human connection, even though it, it's it's a touchless virtual world. And then this is this is really lastly, we we're talking a lot about impact. So measure the impact, and we want to look for ways measurable impact. So what does that look like? We know that data is currency. And just as Tracy mentioned, I mean, we're thinking about funding models and, and how do we make the case for funding? And so thinking through new ways that you, you can measure that impact, you know, what does that look like? Again, we're thinking about the kid who has to walk 20 minutes, you know, it, is that a mapping of, of, you know, the walking distance of your area and who are the users that are in that, that too far to walk and how can you reach them and starting to map that and look at that and then how can you tie that back to these rapid deployment models um, especially as you're thinking about you know funding opportunities coming up mm -hmm. and that's all I have so and again Tracy feel free to jump in on any of those those action points those are all really great actions Allison and the only other thing I think I would add at this point um, Don as a call to action would be to um, critically assess your, your situation, your built environment, your community, as Allison is talking about, um, gathering the data related to those walking distances, as an example, also gathering data about your existing building or buildings um, and uh, establishing you know, what deferred maintenance needs to be taken care of and putting a price tag on that, engaging with engineers to help you um, price that out or local builders or, or whoever the design professionals and construction professionals are that are in your region um, because data is currency. That's exactly right. Um, it's, the emotional appeal is required as well, um, but if, it's, if they, you have the emotional appeal married with data uh, and real numbers and metrics, that is going to, that's what's going to get you the attention. Great point. Excellent. Uh, beautiful, Allison. Great presentation. You touched on so many things. Uh, I ran out of paper uh, listing questions for both of you. Um, one of which is the, the response. You touched on the, the circumstances, you know, Houston, Harvey, what, what a horrible thing, a massive thing. We've, we've been looking at this scenario for uh, several years now of inclusion, which a lot of these extensions provide, right? Is access to the library, library services uh, around the community. Those same kinds of resources can increase resilience for the community. And so uh, we, the term is uh, second responders, I think, uh, is become more or less a, a adopted generally now. And there hasn't been another category besides first responder, which in a large scale event, they're just completely overwhelmed and, and hardly responsive at all because of the scale of the demand. So then we come to secondary facilities that, you know, shelters, uh, distribution points, points of access for information, communication, schools, libraries, and they automatically play this role whether they plan to or not because people just show up at the door. And so we've tried to make the point, you know, you might as well be ready and plan for that a little bit. And that's an, a valuable application. Yet another role, uh, telehealth came up. Uh, next week, we're having a session on telehealth, getting telehealthy at the library. And so we're going to have a uh, uh, we're going to have a local library from Texas, and we're going to have the state library from Delaware, who just announced an initiative a couple of days ago, where they're opening up these uh, these kiosks, which 
can enable that. You know, there are issues of, of privacy and so forth. Uh, it's complicated. All of this kind of just reinforces this notion of the, the library as the, the Swiss army knife of civic institutions. You know, every time anybody dreams up something new and they don't know how to do it, they go, well, the library can probably figure it out. Yep. So <laughs> uh, 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 does Ginsler do library design outside of the US? And if they do, what can you say about the commonality across these different environments? Yes, so um, yes, not a ton, but a few. Um, we uh, actually did a music library specifically in Seoul. Korea is probably one of our most recent ones. Um, I will say what we found the libraries outside of the US are definitely dealing with a different set of issues than, than we deal with here. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, many other countries that just kind of the, the social structure, social safety net is very different. And so the library is not filling in as maybe as many gaps as we see here in the US. Um, I, I think that's sort, sort of the biggest difference I see, you know, kind of globally versus um, America and, and some other, you know, other countries that have a diff similar social structure. Sure. The interesting, Don, if I might jump Go ahead, in. Please, yeah, um, thank you. I, I am heavily involved with IFLA and, and therefore have the great pleasure to travel around to many of the world's libraries and to have a good network of, of international librarians. And while it is true, the funding is very different in different parts of the world, which, which creates a maybe a different um, dynamic in terms of, of need, perhaps, but there are so many similarities about how uh, people think about what a library can do that really, I think, is a pretty consistent um, idea about community gathering and community um, kind of uh, leg up teaching skills and um, hands-on learning to, to teach those skills and um, leveraging technology in, in new ways and in a lot of ways I would say we, we in the US have a lot to learn from other library uh, locations around the world in terms of the use of technology in, in very deep and meaningful ways. Um, but some of the same themes, you know, human connection, um, supporting the daily life, um, wanting the library to just be a part of every day, um, the nine minute walk mm -hmm. um, idea is, is very consistent. There's a lot of cross lessons, I think, that we can share. Oh, that's great. Uh, this, this notion of hyper-local is fascinating and just local generally, community basically. Uh, in the US, the model is local, uh, that the funding is primarily local, that the, uh, that the governance of libraries depends upon what its community wants it to do. Uh, unlike schools, for example, which, you know, are mostly state funded and then therefore directed by the states to do whatever the state thinks is important. Uh, and that, that can be good, but it, it's not actually as attentive to local realities and needs as might be preferable. This is a great advantage that libraries have. I mean, they can, they can be music libraries, they can be, you know, chainsaw libraries, anything the community wants them to do. They can do if you know if they're willing, and and they generally try because that's that's who they are as the community itself. Um, this point about uh, uh, budgets, which relates to the this infrastructure bill and planning, and you know it, it gets down to money pretty quickly. So a question is, uh, if you were rethinking how you how you implement your library, and you're attracted to this notion of extensions and outside environments, how would you go about kind of thinking in terms of cost or as a portion of the cost uh, to implement such things? The point that we've tried to make is that one of the simplest, least expensive ways to extend the library in the community is with connectivity because it is really comparatively inexpensive attribute. And when you do the comparison on the value of the library service today, or at least through the pandemic, that access to the internet has been really, it was already really important because one in three adults used to access the internet at a library. 
you know, that's nearly 80 million people. Stunning number. And then there are, of course, the library of digital services, which you have to have access to, to, uh, uh, to get to. So as an inexpensive way uh, to provide access to valuable services, it, we've been trying to explore, well, how can you lead the conversation to extend the library with digital access, not, I mean, it's a physical place, but it actually is digital services. As a, as a kind of a, a foundation point to then build off other higher touch things and, and so forth. So what kind of cost variation or percentage would, is there any kind of number like that you could come up with to plan to distribute the library, let it flow out into the community rather than pull it out to the community? Any, either of you may take a shot at that. Link the yeah, question. I, I wish I was a contractor and could, um come up with some good good numbers on the fly it, it's it, it is a little hard to yeah I, I don't know Tracy if you have you know maybe some recent examples or anything um because I, the theoretically there there's some trade-off right as you can you know think about that that decentralization of the library and the services it, it's you know hopefully a, a reallocation of funding um to, to get to those notes the node model, which I, I love Tracy's diagram of, of the node model. I think that's a beautiful way to, to explain that concept. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think if I've got any solid, I, I, even just kind of historically going through some projects, but um, I don't know that I've got a solid percentage or rule of thumb that, that we're seeing. Yeah, and it's so different from community mm -hmm. to community as well um, and scale. Is, is going to play a huge role in that. And if you're talking about a library that already has some distribution with branches, um, you know, that, that proposition is a little different. So it would be very difficult to come up with a number or even a percentage. I think what you're hitting upon, Don, though, is that there's there are infrastructure costs to that. There's the operational side to that. Um, and that's the piece that I think, um, as we think about how much libraries, especially in the US, um, as I speak to, to just operational budgets continue to either stay static or shrink, and yet libraries are pressed upon to do more and more and more all the time. And now we're saying not only do you have to keep doing more and more, um, but you also should be distributing your services widely instead of like this one operational node. Um, I don't know that it is possible to to continue to accommodate and stuff all these different services into the same bucket of money um so yeah i think that there is a reckoning coming coming and that's why i keep wanting to position the idea of um this is the moment this is the time there's already been disruption people are ready um, it's not a luxury, it is a necessity. Um, you know, client, climate scientists are, are pretty clear that there will be more and more disruptions and resilience is going to be key to getting through these. Um, so we, we can't afford to keep shutting things down completely. And that includes the library. The library is a lifeline. All of you know that um, to so many. Uh, we can't afford to, to have these long shutdowns um, and, and try and open back up again. We need to figure out how to how to bounce back much more agilely. Is agilely a word? Yeah, it's a good <laughs> word. Well, I would just say, I, you know, I love the, the term resilience. Um, just, it's so holistic, but I mean, the library really is the resilience center of a community. And um, it, again, the, I think just as Tracy said, this is a moment and if, if we can, you know, really understand how to express this need at people see it now. Um, it, it has been, you know, painfully obvious this, this last year what that need is and the library is so well positioned to fulfill that. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a matter of really communicating that in, in a way that that secures that funding um, that is so desperately needed. Nope, Don, you are muted. Great points. 
uh, on resilience and uh, the increasing need for it. We'd been focusing all these different kinds of crises. You know, they were mostly climate driven extreme weather events. But then we had, you know, all these people pouring out into the street in reaction to these different social events and yet another type of a crisis. It's just all happening. Last year was the cascade of crises. <laughs> And you're right, the, you know, the, the, the climate is not expected to, to relax here and it didn't seem to care at all about the pandemic. And I think that's a reasonable expectation for, and that was a crisis, that was a disaster that we did not anticipate when we were setting these up, these responders. But in fact, it is yet another demand on the library. And these arguments, these, these cases need to be made just now. And I think my call to action would ask the two of you to join together and write uh, an op-ed that, that all our libraries could use in making their case, their importance, their value, and to you know, not only not cut the budget, but increase the budget and kind of catch up to all the responsibilities we've laid on the libraries for, for years and decades now. So I, I'm gonna ask each of you to uh, close if you, if you have something else you'd like to add uh, and then we'll wrap up the formal session here. So Tracy, it looks like you're on. So why don't you give us a, a last thought here, if you have one. Uh, well, I think a last thought, and by the way, call to action, game to write anytime. Yes. Uh, if Don, especially if you'll help us place that op-ed somewhere where it will get, get seen, <laughs> happy to do that. I think the, the, the lasting thought for me is is finding op optimism and like the silver lining in all of this. It really is a, an opportunity um, that we've been presented here to make meaningful change and the built environment has a role to play in that. Um, and so libraries that are thinking about how to leverage funding uh, more carefully or more intentionally um, should be thinking really long-term and how these short-term fixes in response to say a leaky roof um, might have a long-term impact that will feed the community and, and bolster that resilience long, you know, in the long run. Um, so I guess that my challenge is to the folks out there that are, are listening or will be when this is, it's, since it's recorded, um, to, to always look for that um, kind of double dipping, if you will, of what, what a short-term fix can give you for a long-term gain. Great point. Long-term thinking, even as we're being you know, hit by a, a momentary uh, uh, pressure. Yeah, great, great notion. Allison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I guess sort of a closing thought might, might be a bit more personal, but um, I, I know all of us coming through this last year, you know, just as you said, Don, has it, we have been hit by so many different crises. Um, I, I myself was a long haul COVIDer, and so, you know, I'm sort of coming out of that. And, um, you know, oh. it's let's give ourselves some grace. Um, you know, we are, we are all in this together and um, just remembering that, that there is a support network out there, right? And, and be gracious to yourself. And, um, you know, I know some of us are running on empty and let's as, reach out, uh, reach out, make connections. Um, there, there are so many like-minded people like you out there. Um, so make those connections and uh, together we can, we can do some great things and, and really, seize this moment um, and energize each other as we work towards this and, and make really positive change happen. Wonderful, wonderful. You, you make the point about, you know, librarians have been caring for people mm -hmm. uh, in new ways over this, over the course of pandemic, but the librarians themselves, I think, haven't had that kind of right. support that they deserve and that, that you know, it gets kind of wearing to uh, suffer other people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, issues and, and, and psychological challenges. Uh, and librarians, by their nature, if I can generalize, are extremely empathetic. So that means they're taking more of this in than the average person would. And so, yes, uh, part of what we're trying to do with these is, is, to, is to have sharings like that. What, what I love about having you both on today and, and, and architects in general 
is their ability to express things in language, uh, you know, social, sociological language that relates to physical and the built environment. And this is so useful to help others who struggle to describe things appropriate certain terms and ways of speaking and, and understanding of, of the importance of these environments as they need to describe the need and explain and convince other people uh, to support that. So thank you so much, both of you for coming on. This is just a fabulous session today. Well, the recording should be up by Monday. And uh, before we close, uh, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute, unmute if you would, everybody please. Because if we were together in a normal way at a conference somewhere in a room, we would be giving you applause right now. So that's what we're going to do, everybody. Let's give our speakers a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Very great. Thank you. Uh,